good morning students uh, good morning sir uh, so we are back at our second week here of design and culture learning series by arch uh, the aim of it is to spread deeper sensitivity and understanding of design culture among inspiring students and eager learners so today we have with us uh, mr madan meena sir um, so i would like to uh, give a brief background of his rich cult experience so he is a practicing visual artist and a researcher working extensively with the rural nomadic and tribal communities his personal association with his region and its people led him to choose as his doctoral thesis art of meena tribe focusing on the women of the meena tribe he has documented and exhibited their art of wall painting across the country and abroad his work on the subject is available in his two published books joy of creativity and nurturing walls sir's curiosity about languages led him to start work on the secret language of denotified of the denotified and the nomadic tribes for this he received a fellowship from the firebird foundation for anthropological research us he continuously studies languishing craft traditions the subject which he also teaches as a visiting faculty at some of the design institute in india he is a trustee of bhasha research at public and publication center vadodara executive member of kota heritage society and executive board member of gramin shiksha kendra savai madhopur one of his uh, important responsibility currently is with the adivasi academy in gujarat where he has been the honorary honorary director for the last 4 years so i welcome you sir and uh, open the stage for you for the students thank you so good morning students <clears throat> uh, as i have been introduced to have been doing various different kinds of works but most of these works are <clears throat> centered around people and around culture and primarily rajasthan though i have my <clears throat> work of area in Gujarat and Madhya Pradesh also, and some of the tribal communities in other parts of India. Uh, but here, yeah, major focus has been always Rajasthan, which I find very important from every perspective. So this session, which is particularly related to, <clears throat> as I have sent a little brief about it. This is about sustainability, and when we talk of sustainability, then three criteria become important. That is, roti kapda makan. That is, that is our basic need. That is. required for us sustainability that is how we sustain over the generations we have sustained throughout the ages actually uh, based on these three things which are very important part of our life but i am going to talk about the diversity that is that has given rise to sustainability uh, and that that is what we define as a culture because culture just doesn't mean few practices but it's a big ecosystem and that's ecosystem need to be understood that ecosystem could be a macroscopic means larger ecosystem where you you can imagine rajasthan it could be very microscopic microscopic in the reason uh, where your institute is right now situated it is in a region which is ethno geographically it is called dhundar so uh, now that dhundar will have a particular kind of a cultural ecosystem so that also need to be understood it's just not that rajasthan when the word comes like rajasthan so people think that rajasthan is a desert or or it's a it's a state of forts and palaces that is not really rajasthan mean actually rajasthan has a big diversity which is there in your roti kapda makan whatever when we define all these things it is there that that exists till date also that is how uh, i'll take the session so uh, if you have any questions you will you will be free to ask those questions at the end of the session but what i'll be sharing over here is all my research it is not coming from any uh, any any kind of books it's not coming from secondary research it is purely what i have researched in my life so that is what i am going to share over here so uh, as sir has said that i right now i work with bhasha research and publication center this is one of the organization that works with the languages it is about <clears throat> sustainability mapping of the languages survival of the languages and propagation of the languages and majorly we work with the tribal languages because if you believe 90% of india's languages are spoken by the tribal communities which are only 10% of total india's population i am repeating it again 90% indian languages are spoken by the tribal communities which form less than 10% of india's population 
while the other rest of the population is speaking only 10% languages so you can understand that the that the diversity of languages lies with the communities who are who are tribes who are agriculturists or communities who are like pastoralists or the communities who are like musicians those people have survived the languages so my organization has done a big project called people's linguistic survey of india which has mapped 800 uh, around 800 languages across india so you can understand that 800 languages still are still spoken in india by the communities okay so i'm going to talk about these diversities then the cultural diversities then the visual diversities and the diversities even related to the material culture like textile so just going to share my slide and this presentation will be around 30 to 40 minutes so just bear with me talking about this mapping sustainability okay so what you see just by looking at this one particular slide these photographs are quite old uh, taken in 1917 and 80s by a lady called elizabeth simpson who just came to rajasthan only for one purpose that she was so much fascinated by the turbans that that people in rajasthan wear and she saw these turbans she saw these people mainly the musician communities like the langa mangniyar and kalbeliyas who were visiting abroad during the india festivals which happen in the 70s and 80s <clears throat> so she saw those performances in england and then she just decided to come back to india and document these these turbans in, in rajasthan because she met these people from rajasthan so she was so fascinated that she just drove from england she came by car and straight away to a place called borunda which is like 90 kilometers from jodhpur and then there a great cultural historian or i should say a cultural scholar called late komal kothadi he founded this organization called rupai and sansan so she had met komalda we lovely we called komal kothari as komalda so she met komalda in 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 england and that time she requested him that i would like to come and document the turbans so she came and she started documenting these things and over the 30 years she continued coming to india and she has documented uh, hundreds and hundreds of turbans in rajasthan and in gujarat but now the purpose of this picture over here this slide over here is that every turban represents an ethnic culture it represents an ethnic community it represents ethnic profession of the particular community matlab one one image itself is a big identity of that of that particular community of that per, or the person for example there are few turbans which are worn by the pastoralist community so when we talk of the pastoral community it is mainly the rebaris or the rabaris <clears throat> or the raikas what we call in rajasthan or maybe the jats also they are also pastoralist community or another community called gayari community which is the again a pastoralist community or the gujars also so particular turban will identify a particular ethnicity of a particular person or and it will also identify that from which region the person is because it's not that the one kind of a turban could be worn around across the different state maybe if the person is a nomadic person then definitely you can find find the same turban bombay or you can find the same turban delhi also if the person is traveling to that area but if the person is stationed regionally then definitely that signifies that this person is from this particular ethnic background ethnic background means the community it means the particular caste of that community and the particular profession of that community so our cultures has been so visually <coughs> significant significant they have been so uh, iconic that just by looking at the turbans at one time we could have identified the communities so that was the center point of our research into the turbans and over here when you look at it, these turbans and further if you study the details of the turban you can see how they have been tied uh, what kind of a textile has been used in it or how the textile has been treated because there is a block printing uh, there is a tie dye in it uh, there is a bandage also and there is a simple uh, simple dye turbans also and the way they have tied these turbans also has a style in it further these turbans also signifies the social status of the person in the community for example a young boy uh, will have a different turban as compared to an elderly person or a person who is a community leader for example we have these jati panchayat so the the leaders of the jati panchayat will have a particular kind of a turban the turban also changes when the father dies and the person <coughs> owns responsibility of the family so we always have this if you have, if you remember uh, when death happens we have this pagdi rasm so pagdi rasm signifies this uh, 
this important custom that the responsibility of the of the uh, of the family is going to come to that particular person of the family which is who is generally the eldest son of the family so this is how the pagdi's culturally socially <clears throat> signifies uh, an important place in in our culture now coming to this popular saying proverb in rajasthan ki 12 kos boli palte 10 kos pani means that after a certain distance uh, our language changes so suppose you are in J- jaipur uh, if you t- uh, interact with the local people then you will find that their language is of particular kind but if you go to udaipur and if you go to jodhpur or bikaner or alwar or any other part of rajasthan you will find that different people speak different languages and same is the case with water nowadays we do not get a <clears throat> this chance to taste local water because we all drink from the tap water which has a similar taste or we when we go out we generally drink from the bottles so they, those the taste is almost the same but earlier this this proverb has been so popular because of the reason that after almost 12 kos which one kos make to 2.5 and that that uh, that makes 12 kos after 25 kilometers the language used to change and likewise the taste of water also used to change after 10 kos which which means uh, after 25 uh, Thus goes twenty five kilometers, and Bara course means twelve to your twenty four. That is thirty thirty kilometers. So thirty and twenty five kilometers. That was a relationship between the taste of a water and 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 the language or a dialect of that particular place. So now, if we really see the samples of the languages, I am just going to play you few samples of the languages to just understand the diversity of language that exists in Rajasthan. So I have researched on a, one of the uh, oral ballad which is sung across Rajasthan uh, from west to east means from Nagaur to to Haduti Haduti which is east of Rajasthan like Kota Bundi So this particular ballad is sung in memory of a snake deity who will, who is called Teja ji he was born in Kharnal near Nagaur and he was married at Pushkar Pushkar I hope everyone of you know and then he was bitten at a Sursura which is near Kishangarh in Ajmer district and then he's he's worshiped widely by the mostly the agrarian and the tribal communities because they encounter the most of the snake bites and it is it is sung by both hindu and muslim because the snake bites could happen to anyone it is irrespective of the caste or religion it can the snake bites can happen to anyone so both the communities uh, or the all, all kind of religions they uh, they sung this ballad and the ballad is sung uh, during the monsoon when uh, majorly uh, the the episode around teja ji's life has happened during the monsoon and also because the snake bites also happen mostly during the monsoon and mainly in the fields and in the forests so uh, this particular deity has been worshiped preached by the local communities and you name any community it uh, this deity has been uh, worshiped by all the communities in rajasthan and it is also sung by various communities and now when i talk about that it has been sung it doesn't mean that they, these are professional musicians this particular ballad has been sung only by the non professional musician this is one such ballad in rajasthan there are few others also along with tejas like there are bagdawats also there are gogaji also which are sung by the non professional musician non professional musicians musicians mean the group of villagers the group of villagers remember these stories of these of, of these legendary uh, hero deities and they sing them in form of jagrans now what are jagrans jagrans are night awakenings raat ko jo hum log mandir mein baith ke jo kirtan bhajan karte hain those are called jagrans so this particular ballad is also sung at night in the jagrans at the shrines of teja ji now teja ji shrines are open shrines they are simple platforms they are under the trees or they are in the open simply a one stone could be just erected and that could just become a teja ji shrine they are not like uh, our classical hindu temples like shikar numa uh, temple they are not shikar uh, shikar temple architecture uh, shrine these are simple open open simple stage shrines that you that we see across rajasthan So now suppose I play one audio sample uh, from a place called Kharnal where Teja Ji was born. So you can you can listen to the language and you can listen to the style of singing also. And then I'll then I'll play other places uh, which are related to Teja Ji or which are related to the geographic uh, geographical diversity of the languages in Rajasthan. So first is this Kharnal. So listen carefully and try to understand the language. If you are from this these regions. you will be able to capture the language bolo teja ji maharaj ke ki jai ho shri mata ki jai ho 
so this is just one audio sample from khadnal uh, and it is sung by the by the same community teja ji belong to the jat community so the, his descendants uh, are still live in the same village so this this audio sample is from the descendants of teja ji now coming to the place where uh, teja ji was bitten by the snake just because for, for the promise that he made to the snake <laughs> so that's a long story but he fulfilled his promise he came to the snake and he allowed the snake to be bitten so that is how he <clears throat> he sacrificed his life so this is a place sursura and over here you will see that there is a use of certain musical instrument there it was only gungru tied to the feet but here some a set of musical instruments are also used and the language differs now because that was uh, almost marwadi and this particular language over here is is uh, near to merwadi because it is near to ajmer so this was at sursura and the, there were three communities who sung this uh, one was this jat another was this mali community and third was the the teli community which lives in sursura so three communities together they form two groups and then they sing one after the another so that was at sursura now coming to another place which is which is mandwas here uh, which is near biawar if any one of you know where biawar is it is towards pali from ajmer over here a community called merati who are muslim uh, community uh, and uh, along with them a gujar community has sung this ballad so just playing a sample from that <laughs> so this was from mandwas uh, <clears throat> from this uh, where these muslims and the hindus both sing it together now coming to this place which is near jaipur uh, near chandwaji when you go towards delhi chandwaji and from chandwaji little far is this place called jaichandpura the community over here are the the brahmins and the meena uh, which sing it together over here so just a see a sample of this so this this particular one is in a language dhundadi which i said that it's a language that belongs to jaipur uh, and it's it is spoken in in jaipur district now coming to further uh, further towards east towards madhya pradesh this is this is a sample from a village near bundi uh, thikarda so uh, 
So this one is the most melodious one because there's a use of various kind of uh, musical instrument. There's a flute instrument called algoza. There's a dholak and there's a majira. So three sets of musical instruments are also used in singing. So this was another sample. So like this, I just played uh, selected samples. Um, sir, uh, I just want to make a request. Like, if you can share this, uh, if you can share this presentation with us, because I guess uh, because of certain reason we are not able to clearly hear all the audios. We got some idea, but it's not clear. So it okay. would be really helpful if you can share the presentation with us. So that is over. Uh, that part is over. So I am just coming to this uh, this slide, uh, which says that. Uh, which has mapped the languages through this oral ballad. The language has been mapped through this oral tradition that exists in Rajasthan. So, so this is spoken in various languages, sung in various languages, like in one like Saharia language, Marwadi, Dundadi, Taleti, Haduti, Mirwadi, Khadi Marwadi, Nagar Chali. The purpose of this is this that Rajasthan itself represents at, at least there are 30 surviving languages which are spoken till date. So this, which is starting from Kharnal, if we map towards Madhya Pradesh, so these are seven, eight languages into which this particular ballad is sung. So that was the purpose to just explain you that how different oral traditions has been preserved in, in local languages. Now coming to this particular, which would, which I would like to skip because of a uh, less time. Uh, over here, I was talking to you that on macroscopic and microscopic also. So this has been a case study of a small region within the Bartme district. It is not across Rajasthan. It is just within a small district of Rajasthan called Badmer. And over there in three places, I have found that one particular uh, story, which is like Umar Marvi or another kind of folk song called Kurja, they have been sung in different languages. So various languages can exist in a, micro, in a small region also. That is also a case. Now coming to the material culture, suppose, uh, let us understand that through this textile. So if we see these two images, uh, we can identify the community that uh, what community is this because as I said that earlier, I showed you those photographs of turbans. Similarly over here also, if you look at these textile and textile, when you look at textile, I mean the, the kind of skirt the woman is wearing, the kind of uh, angarki or the blouse or the shirt that she is wearing and the odni that she is, she is wearing and even the jewelry also. Just by looking at that, you can identify the community and you can identify the region also from which region it belongs to, she, you know, the, the woman or the community belongs to. So for example, in the left image, you can see these two women standing, is standing with children. So in the left hand side, uh, in, the, in the left hand side image, on the left, left hand side woman with a, with a black uh, angarki that she is wearing, she is wearing a particular kind of a, of a print in a skirt, which is called Makoda print. Now this Makoda print is worn only by the young women who are either newly married or who has been married, but they have not gone to their in-laws. Like we, we have this custom of ki gona, jiska gona na kiya ho. So, so, so she is a young woman and on the right hand side, you can see another woman in that particular image on the left hand side image. She is wearing a particular print called Qatar. Now Qatar is generally worn by the women uh, who have children after marriage. So that represents the two different social status of these women. And then similarly, the Odinis also that they are wearing. Now, these two prints that, that we see, the Makoda print and the Qatar print, this also signifies that these women are from Marwar region because that kind of a print is only worn in Marwar region. It can't be worn in Jaipur because Jaipur has different set of prints because if you know Bagru, so Bagru has been printing a different set of block prints. They have, we have different sets of designs over here. So the woman over here has been wearing a different kind of textiles. So just by looking at this image, we can say that this woman is from Marwad and then they are from which community? They are from the Rabari community again, what I said. Means the Raika, the pastoralist community who graze sheep and camels. So that's the community you can just see by visually by looking at the picture. Now on the right hand side, by looking just even the charkha, the rehat, or, or looking by the print that she is wearing, uh, the kappa, the print is called kappa, the right hand side, and the woman is wearing a red only and the red blouse. 
so there are various meanings which comes out of this the first meaning that comes out out and which is visible also that she is from a weaver community because she is spinning thread <clears throat> she is wearing a red odni and red blouse that means she is a widow so because that kind of a particular clothes in in rajasthan particularly because she is from west rajasthan signifies that she is a widow now the kapa print that she is wearing also signifies that she is a widow so the prints also signifies the social status this signifies the community and this signifies the region now what is the reason where this this is printed so you must have heard of a place called pipar which is known for block printing so all these block prints are from pipar so if you even go to today also you will find that the communities the who are the, who are the cheaper the in in pipar they are still printing these clothes for the local communities or maybe for the urban market also because all big brands now work with them but still they draw their reference from these traditional prints so the traditional prints the traditional designs has direct relevance with the community's identity and the region's identity kapda now we talk of food now so similarly we have a great diversity of food in rajasthan so if we look at rajasthan geographically uh, looking to the climatic condition looking to the ecological conditions and looking to the geographical conditions we'll see that one part which is almost 3/4 is a desert rest of the of the state like south south of rajasthan is not a desert it's a forest area inhabited by the uh, by the tribal communities then the eastern part adjoining to mp and the northern part is a different kind of a terrain which is a aravli region which is uh, the whole aravli range passes through this region it's a forest region again which has rivers also so these three different regions grow dif three different kind of staple foods so suppose west rajasthan which is a desert grows bajra so majorly the the food that they eat is millet it, it consists of millets then the south rajasthan which is a tribal region is a makka it's it's a corn region so people over there eat corn and then the region starting from jaipur to north of rajasthan like alwar coming to savai madhopur karoli it's a sorghum it's a jawar region the area in this region has been eating jawar it is very lately then when we have this agriculture facilities when this canals has come from indira gandhi canal and narmada canal has all come in now this food pattern is changing now we, everyone is growing wheat now wheat has been introduced recently wheat is not very old in rajasthan not more than 40 50 years when we started cultivating wheat nowadays we all eat wheat and and people in these regions also eat eat started eating wheat similarly the rice rice was not there in rajasthan but we eat rice because it is newly introduced and some places in rajasthan are cultivating uh, uh, rice also so through this also the purpose of telling you this food diversity is that this food diversity is directly linked to a culture and how it is linked to the culture it link because these are ethno cultural zones which grows different kind of uh, which has a relationship with the with the food why because south of rajasthan which grows corn is called wagad it's a region it's a tribal region called wagad then it's the west rajasthan is a marwad region which has a different culture it has a different language patterns and it have a different set of people similarly jowar zone which is jaipur and all to all east of jaipur and north of jaipur it grows jowar so it has a different culture culture it has different languages if it has different communities living there so this particular uh, slide represents a museum actually uh, this slide is from a museum called arna jhanna the desert museum of rajasthan and uh, over there uh, the museum has tried to map grasses and it has tried to uh, collect brooms made with different grasses so the purpose of the museum was to map cultures of rajasthan through brooms now this is quite an amazing thing how to connect a broom uh, with a culture the connection is very simple the connection is this that particular kind of uh, broom which are made are made through local grasses and these local grasses grows in particular geographic zones all, along with the crops that we grow over there so for example bajra have a different set of grasses that grows in that region because of the ecological conditions also and similarly is with the corn and sorghum that they have different set of grasses so different kinds of brooms are made in rural areas i am not talking of the urban areas where we only have limited two three brooms like we have seen ka jhadu full jhadu and now this plastic broom has also come or nariyal broom we have in cities but it is about the rural areas where we see varieties of broom because 
the brooms are used differently in different spaces. For example, if it is a mud plastered surface, then the grass broom is used. If it is a cattle shed, then broom maybe for little sturdy broom made out of a branch of a tree will be used. Or if it is it is a pavement, it's a road, then a different kind of brooms are are used over there. So this museum has tried to define different broom, classify different brooms from different regions of Rajasthan, all collected from these different three, uh, three food zones of Rajasthan. And they talk about the philosophy, they talk about the broom makers, they talk about the casteism that exists with the communities who makes broom or the, or the super community which exists in Rajasthan. So that slide was from this, which talks about the food basically and culture. Now coming to the visual culture of the, of housing also we uh, when we talk of roti kapda makan now there is a great diversity that has existed in, in housing also nowadays we have all concrete houses similar structures whether it is jaipur or jodhpur but if you still you go in the villages you will find a different patterns of housing over there because the houses are made from local material and the local material is majorly it is clay some places the stones are available, so you, the, the stones are used, even slabbing also stones are used, floor also stone are used. But these particular pictures from, come from Savai Madhupur region, uh, which is, uh, you can see in the map, in east of Rajasthan. And there the houses are of mud. Though the houses are mud, but we have a culture of decorating them. Uh, uh, unlike what we do not see today that people uh, decorating their own houses, that is there, but we, we generally hire architects, we, we hire interior designers to do our own houses. But here, right from the construction of the house to, the, to its beautification comes under the domain of the communities or done under the domain of the families who build the house, these houses. But now in that also there's a big diversity. So I have tried to map this visual art means the, 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 the art form which is practiced on this uh, wall. So it's a Mina wall painting and I have tried to map them also. And in that it's not a big region. It's simply a region of three districts if I talk about Savai Madhupur, Karoli and Tok region. And in that too I have found a great diversity in the stylistic, uh, in the style of paintings. And, and I have tried to further uh, means divided into the microscopic zones. So you can see that it's the Savai Madhupur zone, there's a uh, Uniara Aligarh region, then there's a Tonk Jastana region. So that like that, there are some <clears throat> 12 to 16 regions. And in that, I have found that the style differs from, from one place to another. And thank you so much, sir, for this informative session. There's a lot of knowledge that has been circulated. I think we will meet the students again at 12.30 and discuss on this session. Thank I you so much. Thank I you so much, sir. Thank, thank you. So much. Thank you very much. Thank you.